So good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar featuring the newly published book, Birds of Maine, and a discussion about the conservation status of birds here in Maine. We would love to be with you in person today for this presentation, uh, but we appreciate you joining us here online on Zoom instead. Um, I hope that you and your families are safe and healthy during this COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Todd Martin. I'm the Grassroots Outreach Coordinator at the Natural Resources Council of Maine. NRCM is a nonprofit membership organization protecting, restoring, and conserving Maine's environment now and for future generations. For more than 60 years, NRCM has helped protect the places and the way of life that make Maine so special. We harness the power of the law, science, and the voices of more than 25,000 members and supporters around Maine, around the country, and around the world. We have a staff of 28, and our office is located in Augusta, just steps from the State House. So before we get started with our uh, program this afternoon, uh, just a few notes about the Zoom platform that we're using this afternoon. Uh, more than a year into this pandemic, I'm sure we're all experts with Zoom by now, but just a couple of reminders. The first thing is that this webinar is being recorded, and tomorrow you'll receive an email from me with a link to watch the recording on YouTube. And we hope that you'll share that recording with friends and family. Your video and your audio is disabled this afternoon by design. You'll only be able to see and hear our presenters this afternoon. But if you have a question for either Jeff or Barbara or Allison uh, or me, uh, don't ask me questions. <laughs> You're welcome to type those questions in the Q&A box, which can be found on the lower ribbon of your Zoom screen. And we'll have plenty of time for question and answer um, after Jeff and Barbara's presentation. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Allison Wells, who is NRCM's Senior Director of Public Affairs and Communication to introduce the book and our two presenters this afternoon. So take it away, Allison. Thanks, Todd. Good afternoon, everyone. We're so glad you could join us today. On behalf of the Natural Resources Council of Maine, I'm pleased to welcome you to a fascinating lunchtime presentation of the birds of Maine. The first authoritative overview of, Maine, of Maine's bird life since 1949, and perhaps the most comprehensive and visually stunning state-based bird book ever published. We are honored to have with us two people who are deeply involved with seeing this landmark book to completion. Birds of Maine is the life work of one of Maine's leading ornithologist, Peter Vickery, who passed away in 2017. Before his passing, Peter assembled a team of experts to make sure the book he envisioned would be published and shared with the world. Fortunately, Peter's wife, Barbara Vickery, was as committed to bringing this book to completion as Peter was. It was Barbara's guiding hand that miraculously kept this project on schedule. Barbara is herself a well-known conservation professional here in Maine. She worked for the Maine chapter of the Nature Conservancy for more than 30 years before her retirement, most recently as conservation programs director. I know firsthand what was entailed in producing this book. Barbara is joined today by ornithologist Jeff Wells, who happens to be my husband. Uh, he was part of the team that helped see the book to completion. Jeff is also a fixture of the bird and conservation community and serves as vice president of the Boreal Conservation Program for the National Audubon Society. On a personal note, on a personal note I'll just add that Peter was always a positive presence in our lives. His legacy lives on in many ways. One of Jeff's first ornithological jobs was as Peter's research assistant on the Kennebunk, Kennebunk Plains. Peter's work was instrumental in protecting the special place for generations to come. I had the good fortune of spending time in the field with them, and I will always cherish Peter's passion for learning and sharing his knowledge, his good humor, and his commitment to helping young people become better birders and professional ornithologists. Barbara and Jeff, thank you for being here today and for the great presentation to come. Thanks for having us, Allison. Yes, thank you. So I should, I'm going to just start the uh, PowerPoint, Barbara. Okay. So uh, start, let's see. Um, share screen. Great. So um, I suspect many of you have already seen a copy of the book or maybe read about it. And if you haven't yet, you can quickly get a sense um, by checking on the Princeton U Press website or Amazon where you can use that nifty look inside feature. 
or better yet, take a look in person at one of your favorite bookstores. Um, so our plan today is not to tell you everything that's in the book, but 600 and some odd pages long, but instead do two things, tell you a bit about how the book came to be and highlight some key findings outlined, outlined in this book in relation to bird conservation in Maine. As Allison said, Jeff, you need to switch. I'm gonna keep talking because we're gonna keep up, yep. Sorry. <laughs> So Birds of Maine does represent the decades long efforts of Peter to create this comprehensive, uh, the first comprehensive book of, on Maine birds in more than 70 years, as Allison said. And it also represents a labor of love on behalf of a large team to bring Peter's vision to fruition. Next. Peter didn't get a pair of binoculars or a field guide until he was 21, but he soon became a passionate birder and ornithologist. Next. When Peter and I moved to Maine in the 1970s, Peter began, there you go, trying to see every bird in the state on land or sea. Here he is on the Blue Nose Ferry to Nova Scotia. His Bible was Ralph Palmer's deeply researched book, Maine Birds. He went to hear Palmer give a talk and afterwards Peter introduced himself. Ralph Palmer was a bit of a curmudgeon, but he was astonishingly knowledgeable about a wide array of natural history topics. And Peter had an equally wide ranging curiosity. So they soon became friends and correspondents. This was long before email. And Peter next invited Palmer to join on an early Monhegan Christmas bird count. Thereafter, it was a tradition for the team to have lunch at Palmer's house in Tenants Harbor after the count. Peter soon found that however authoritative, Palmer's book published in 1949 was increasingly outdated. And Pete, Palmer's the, the grumpy looking guy on the right in the big coat. <laughs> and Peter began gathering material for an update. Starting with the annotated checklist he published in 1978 with Maine Audubon that included 30 species that had not been listed in Maine, Palmer's Maine birds 30 years earlier because they had not then been known to exist in the state. Next. In addition to his own extensive field work, Peter gathered volumes of old records and hunted down long out of print journals. I believe he collected the most complete set of the dozen main bird journals published between 1900 and 2000 of any library. He also consulted eBird for more recent records, of course. In 2001, next, told, Peter told Palmer that he'd begun working on the book in earnest. Palmer wrote back that there had been so many changes in Maine's bird life, he doubted anyone could capture them all, but Peter was intent on doing so. When Peter got his diagnosis of terminal cancer in 2015, he had compiled the pertinent data for nearly all of Maine's 464 species and written 350 species accounts. But there were those 114 species accounts and four chapters he envisioned but hadn't drafted yet to be written. A kind doctor advised him to assemble a team to take the book over the finish line. Peter had already recruited next Bill Sheehan, who lives in Aroostook County to draft waterfowl accounts and provide a Northern Maine perspective. That's Bill on the left. The giant in the middle is Lars, about whom you'll hear more in a second. Next, he asked Jeff, who had been Peter's field assistant when working on grassland birds, now an expert on boreal bird conservation to complete the warbler accounts. Next, and Charles Duncan, with whom Peter had taught seabird workshops at UMA Machias and had become head of the Manomet's Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network to write the remaining seabird accounts and update Peter's shorebird accounts, many of which Peter had drafted a decade earlier. Next, Peter asked his friend Scott Widensall, author of dozens of natural history books and a cool one just out now on migration, with whom he had taught ornithology at Hog Island to be the team captain and chief editor. Next. Peter also re reconnected with his old friend, Lars Johnson, world renowned Swedish bird artist. Peter and Lars talked through what species Peter hoped to have Lars paint for the book. Lars made three trips to Maine from Sweden to prepare studies for the book's paintings. Next. Barry Van Dusen, a colleague while Peter worked at Mass Audubon, generously agreed to open his archive of hundreds of published ink drawings without charge and to do dozens of additional new drawings for the book. Next. So this was the core team that was needed to complete Peter's work. And now with their advice, P 
Peter drafted an outline, secured the publishing agreements with Princeton and Nuttall Ornithological Club, and assigned the remaining writing tasks. The wider team that brought the book through productions included five additional contributing authors, a cartographer, three graphic designers, and a series of hired editing assistants who didn't make it onto the opening credits page, but are warmly acknowledged. Next. So the book includes four in, in sort of introductory chapters, the obligatory introduction chapter, of course, um, then a chapter that is about how the distribution of birds in Maine reflects Maine's fundamental geography, Maine's ornithology Ornithological History, written by Jeff and um, Jody Dupre, that includes some, some surprises, like who knew that Teddy Roosevelt got his start with becoming a, a birder in Maine. And the fourth chapter, which Jeff and I believe is the most important, the current status and conservation needs of Maine birds. Next. It was really important to Peter that this book be accessible and interesting to all Mainers. So the visual appeal and variety was important. There are lots of charts, pull out sidebars and maps, great maps done by um, Bill Hancock. Range maps for every species that reaches a, a range limit in the state, whether Northern species reading, reaching a Southern range limit like this American three-toed woodpecker or the opposite. And migration maps, which is, a th we think, unique in um, Birds of State X books so far. It's made possible by extraordinary advances in technology, allowing scientists to track individual birds and adding tremendously to our understanding of where birds go when they leave Maine. So I know many of us have heard the story that Arctic terns have this amazing migration from the um, North Atlantic all the way to. Um, the Antarctic Ocean, but who knew, this is, these are tracks of, I don't remember, about maybe a dozen different birds. Um, each line represents a different bird. That in the fall migration, they went down around the bulge of Africa and along the west coast of Africa, and then crossed over to the um, coast of South America, and then spent their summer, our, our winter, um, foraging all along the coast of Antarctica and then returned back following a slightly different route. Next. And then of course there are the paintings which are magnificent. I wish there were more of them in there but um, this is what we what we were able to get from Lars. And next this drawing lots more of the evocative drawings. We're very fortunate that we were able to get some kind of visual um, on almost every single page. Next. But of course, the meat of the book are the species accounts. And these include the current status in sort of a summary at the beginning, like a precy, um, the, their history in Maine, their global distribution, their conservation status, and seasonal arrival and departure dates and highs and lows by different parts of, different parts of the state. And I imagine that for some of you who are birders, that may be the part that you really geek out on. But for the rest of us, um, the other parts of the writing are more interesting. Uh, now over to you, Jeff. Well, thank you, um, Barbara. And thank you uh, to uh, NRCM and for all of you for being on with us today. Um, I, I want to add, you know, that uh, yeah, uh, it, it was uh, a great honor to be able to be part of this project that was a legacy of Peter's lifetime of work here. And Peter was um, incredibly important in my life, um, you know, as a as a very early mentor, even when I was in high school, when I would call him up and, and ask him about what birds that were around and things like that. And he was always very, um, you know, open to listening and, and uh, sharing information. And, um, you know, Allison kind of alluded to you know his uh, his 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 good humor, and and I I was just remembering uh, we we Alistair and I were down at the um, former Brunswick Naval Air Base and to uh, look for some grassland birds which are disappearing in the state, and uh, found a couple of meadowlarks down there recently. But I was just thinking about a time when Peter and I were out there on the base when it was still an active military base, and 
we were surveying for grassland birds around the runways and you know there were marines kind of guarding it and um and, and lots of uh, procedures you had to go through and one of the things that they had done was give us a radio that we were supposed to carry with us so we'd be in contact with the tower and when they when they gave us the radio you know the, the military folks have their all their very formal kinds of names and whatever and Peter said, oh, could we, could we be, you know, our call name be Birdman? And, uh, and they were like, well, yeah, I guess so. So then we were, we were out there uh, and we needed to cross one of the pieces of runway. And, you know, um, uh, Peter called up, uh, said the tower, he, tower, this is Birdman. Yes, go, go ahead, Birdman or whatever they do. And he, and, uh, he said, uh, Tower, could we have permission to cross this expanse of macadam? And, uh, you know, sort of um, silence from them for a while. Uh, Birdman, uh, this is Tower, could you repeat? <laughs> and just T Peter's love of language and humor, sort of that, you know, he'd, he'd use some, uh, uh, some, some language and, uh, and, and enjoy that time together and just sort of brought back great, great memories of time with him in the field. Well, as Barbara said, the um, um, the uh, bulk of the book is going over what the the, the uh, species accounts of what the birds that make Maine special, and we wanted to just uh, you know highlight a few of those um, here today. You know, what's more iconic in in Maine than than loons? And I'm going to see if I can just play a little bit of a loon call here and see if it comes across. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, one of our iconic sounds of summer, another one of the iconic sounds of summer, people always don't, don't always know what bird it is that makes this sound is the white-throated sparrow, but the bird that sings old Sam Peabody, 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 or my Canadian friends say, oh, oh sweet Canada, 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 um, uh, iconic birds of Maine. And then we have very specialized birds, um, birds like the Bicknell's thrush you know, from one of Lars, the Lars um, uh, painting in, in the book, um, a bird that has this very isolated breeding range on just mountaintops in New England and parts of Canada shown in blue on, on the right here and, and just winters in very restricted part of the, the greater Antilles. Um, and birders come from all over to climb up early in the morning to mountains to try to see, see the Bicknell's thrush. You know, we have specialty birds that love our boreal forests and basically reach the southern extent of their more northerly breeding range here in Maine. Um, there's a few of them here, like the black-backed woodpecker and the spruce grouse, but boreal chickadee, gray jay, yellow-bellied flycatcher, special birds that people again visit Maine to see. Um, we don't often always recognize that Maine has this incredible diversity of breeding warblers. Um, there are not many places um, in, in the U.S. or anywhere where you can see um, so many different kinds of warblers you know, breeding here in the summer and, and passing through in migration. Just an incredible abundance. Um, our birds of, uh, that we have of, um, you know, our, our waterways and coasts. And of course, most of us have heard of the, the increase in bald eagles and it's still though a thrill, the, the bald eagles and ospreys and the people who have you know, nests of ospreys and bald eagles that they follow now um, to see what happens to them. They sort of feel like they're their osprey or their bald eagle. Um, and of course our, our coastal birds um, and for birders probably, um, especially birders from away, the puffin is, is one of the most well-known. And, and again, we have, um, you know, boat tours that specifically go out to, to look at puffins and see them um, in Maine is, of course, the, the southernmost breeding area for, for puffins, but there's a whole host of other, other birds, um, uh, seabirds that make Maine special. Um, and, and shorebirds, birds like, you know, sandpipers and plovers that um, use our beaches and mudflats in, mostly in migration, um, birds that are just coming through right now in migration as they're heading up to um, the boreal or the Arctic to nest, um, including um, 
you know, even some rare birds, birds that have really greatly declined, like this red knot. Um, I think this might is a picture Peter took, Barbara. At Seawall Beach. So, um, uh, a, a declining bird. And speaking of uh, declining birds and conservation needs, uh, one of the chapters, as Barbara said, that we felt was really important and Peter felt was really important was um, um, the chapter on, on conservation needs. And, you know, to highlight that, the illustration um, beside this chapter is of a bird that no longer occurs in Maine, uh, the great auk, a bird that um, disappeared from the earth, I think in 1844, that was the last great auk that ever lived on, on earth. Um, and, you know, the, the idea of this book and, and certainly the, the chapter on conservation is we don't want to ever see that happen again. And so we, we really um, wrote the book with that, uh, wrote the chapter with that uh, idea in mind, what ways we can help make sure that we don't lose any more birds. Many of you have probably seen the news that was out just a couple of years ago um, of the massive decline in birds that we've seen since 1970. There's almost 3 billion fewer birds now in North America than there were in 1970. Um, and of course, you know, Maine is, is included in that as far as birds that have declined. When we did the analysis for the book, we looked at species that were on one or more conservation concern list, whether it's the federal endangered species list or Maine's own endangered, threatened, special concern list or other ones. And we found that about 40% of all of Maine's birds are listed as of conservation concern in one or more of these places. And it's all types of birds from waterfowl to, to warblers to, to shorebirds and, and, uh, and other kinds of uh, land birds like the uh, rusty blackbird down here in the bottom, bottom right. When we specifically looked at the declining trends um, or the compared declining, decreasing and increasing trends, we found that about twice as many main birds are decreasing as are, are increasing from um, samples that were big enough to detect a change one way or another. And we just wanted to show you um, what some of those decreases look like. Um, these are on an annual basis. So if you look at the top one, bank swallow, and you imagine 11% per year over, um, you know, since 1970 or so, you know, that's a massive, a massive decline, obviously. And, and you can start thinking about that with, with a lot of these species. You also will note that it's not just one type of bird. It's, it's um, aerial insectivores, birds that eat insects on, on the wing, like bank swallows and flycatchers. Um, it's birds of our coasts, like the great black back gull. It's, it's forest birds um, and grassland birds and, and a, a whole variety of birds, wetland birds, um, that are showing some of these decreases. Uh, Barbara, over to you. Thanks, Jeff. So I think most of us, if asked to think about, well, what are, what are the great threats to any species, we would say habitat loss or habitat loss and degradation from fragmentation or poor management or whatever is surely the most important single threat. And I, these maps um, produced, I think, by the state, Maine State Planning Office way back when in 1980 have always struck me as pretty um, remarkable, though the progression from rural areas in white to emerging suburbs, their, their word for it, in yellow, and urban areas much more densely populated in red. And we can see the progression that has already occurred and that is projected to occur in the next 30 years. It's not just forests that matter. Birds that depend on grasslands and, and shrublands, as Jeff just mentioned, are also seeing a steep decline. And in some respects, the, those habitats are the ones that have uh, suffered the most in southern Maine. Next. So that there is much less area for the eastern meadowlark, for instance. And um, Jeff and Allison say that the Brunswick, the former Brunswick Naval Air Base is one of the few places they can reliably still see them. Next. 
Besides grassland and shrubland species, the group of main birds at greatest risk are those that make their living by eating insects on the wing. The so-called insect apocalypse, the global collapse of insect populations, is causing a parallel collapse of these insect eating species. Aerial insectivores like swallows, swifts, and whippoorwills have experienced the steepest declines of all of Maine's hundreds of species. Next. So as Jeff mentioned, bank swallow populations in Maine, while it was an 11% decline on an annual basis, if you think about what that means since 1966, there are now fewer than, well, less than 1% of the population that existed in 1966 still occurs in Maine. When people talk most about in relation to insect decline is usually the decline of pollinators, native bees, flies, butterflies, moths, reasons, habitat loss, climate change, but also outside lights. Next. That, um, that lure night feeding moths to their death, contributing to the decline of luna moths and cecropias on which whippoorwills feed, for instance. A big culprit is insecticides, especially the relatively new class of insecticides called neonicotinoids, now in widespread use, although sort of invisible to most of us. Its link to insect and bird declines is clear enough in Europe that their use there has been banned. There's currently a bill, LD 155, soon to be voted on in the main legislature, that would limit the use of certain neonicotinoid insecticides that have been found to have particularly devastating effects on insects and birds alike. Back to you, Jeff. And of course, one of the, the, the greatest, um, not just looming threats to, to birds and to all sorts of wildlife and ecosystems is, is climate change. Um, we are particularly aware of it, I think, in Maine because of the fact that um, the, the Gulf of Maine is one of the, the fastest, um, the, the areas with the greatest uh, rise in temperature of any marine area around the world. And, um, and we've seen you know, um, a lot of the, the, the worries and impacts, but it's across the board really. Um, Audubon, National Audubon did a report a couple of years ago um, on modeling um, how birds are likely to be affected by, by climate change, uh, kind of a, a sophisticated approach um, to look at both um, continentally and state by state. And, and there's actually even a way you can type in your own zip code and see what birds in your area are going to be impacted. And one of the things that it shows, um, you can just see the, the numbers here, um, at the, the, the worst case warming scenario, there's a lot of birds that are very vulnerable um, and, and we could lose um, either um, by seeing them push north or just seeing their range restricted. Um, the good news is that um, if we try to actually do something and do something quickly to lower the how quickly the temperature rises and the effects um, are, are felt, then we would see a, a much lower number of impacted species. And you can actually uh, look at this on uh, the Audubon website just to see what the difference is between the, the high warming scenario and the, the low warming scenario and what exactly some of the species are that would be impacted. In the book, we talk about some of the species that have expanded into Maine. Um, and we think, um, largely or at least partly from uh, because of climate change, the cardinal being one of those. And you can see in this map how the range has expanded um, over the last, um, you know, 50 or so years. You know, I still remember um, my, my grandmother talking about the very first cardinal she ever saw in mid-coast Maine and how exciting that was. And myself, you know, I remember up in Bangor, you know, when a cardinal appeared when I was birding, you know, I guess, in the maybe the late 70s. And um, the, the wonderful ladies that took me around birding at that time, um, you know, we all got in a car and drove over to somebody's theater just so we could see this one, one cardinal. And now they've expanded so much further. Um, the same is true for things like tufted titmouse, a bird that was basically non-existent in the state prior to about 1950, and now has 
expanded into um, at least about a third of the state. You know, the red-bellied woodpecker um, now quite um, regular across southern Maine, certainly, and just um, kind of exploded in just the last 20 years or so. So lots of examples of species that have been expanding uh, north. We know that the impacts of climate change are, are going to be really varied. It's not just sort of temperature by itself, but there's a whole myriad of kind, uh, kinds of effects. And one of those is from sea level rise. These are some maps that um, NRCM uh, put together showing the amount of area that would be inundated in a couple of places. Um, Bath on the left, um, if those of you who've been to downtown Bath, um, the beautiful uh, historic town and just see how much of it would be underwater at, at, at a one meter rise and at a six meter rise. And another favorite place, uh, George, uh, Reed State Park in Georgetown, um, for those who've been there, you can just see kind of the impact. And um, for birds that nest along that, that narrow strip of, of coastline, birds like the salt marsh sharp-tailed sparrow that just has this you know, this very thin li linear range. I mean, their entire lives are spent within a meter or two of, of sort of high tide and, um, and usually sort of within, you know, half a mile to a mile of, of the coast or even less, sometimes just hundreds of meters, just in this narrow strip of salt marsh. And there's other birds like willets um, and, um, and uh, you know, piping clovers and a whole suite of birds that nest and, and just use that, that narrow linear range. So sea level rise is going to be very impactful to them. And just to show you, um, these are some pictures I, 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 don't, I think Barbara or Peter took um, down at um, Morse Mountain in, in Maine here um, at the Sprague River. Uh, this is an area um, in sort of normal tide. Um, and then this is when you get a, one of those, those big tide events with some wind pushing it and see how the whole marsh is inundated. And, you know, the more, um, as the way this works with sea level rises, you get more of these kinds of events. They happen more frequently. And of course, you can imagine if you're nesting in that salt marsh and you get this, you know, the nest is lost and, um, and you have to start over if there's time, but um, very catastrophic. So we've talked about some of the, the, the threats to these birds. Um, and, you know, we don't want to just hit you over the head with, with bad news because it turns out that there are ways in the past that when we've been faced with um, problems that affect birds, we have found ways to, to fix the problem. Humans actually can do something about um, these problems. At the turn of the century, we had the issue of uncontrolled, unregulated hunting um, uh, for food, for sale in markets and for decorating women's hats, the millinery trade at the time. Um, um, and, you know, in, you could go into a market and find all sorts of wild birds that were for sale, you know, just the way we go into a, a butcher now to get beef and chicken and pork, um, you could get all these other birds. And for those of you who are, you know, more familiar with birds, if you look at this price list here on the right and go down to the bottom, you see things like yellow legs, um, and curlews, probably Eskimo curlews, um, that were sold for $3 a dozen, or reed birds at the very bottom, which are um, another name for bobolinks, which were sold for a dollar a dozen. So, um, you know, that was the, the situation at that time in those early 1900s. Um, but people started um, trying to do something about it. Um, people came together in to form Audubon societies and bird clubs. Um, that was the, the birth of, of, of bird clubs across Maine, across the United States of Audubon chapters. And they came together and banned commercial hunting, uh, hired wardens. Uh, Maine had some of the very first um, wardens on some of the islands to protect seabirds. Sometimes they were actually um, the lighthouse keepers who were hired to watch over the birds. Um, and a whole suite of things um, to take care of the problem. Eventually, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was passed um, in, in um, around 1916. And we saw things get better. You know, birds came back. Um, we have terns and, and gulls and seabirds and all sorts of birds um, because we solved that problem. We saw People come together um, around the Endangered Species Act and around um, the ban of DDT. Of course, Rachel Carson 
with her main connection was instrumental in, in that work. And once we did those things, um, we saw the rebounding of all kinds of things from you know, pelicans and bald eagles and peregrine falcons and, and wood storks and many others that have now come back because of um, recognizing the problem and doing something about it. Here in Maine, you know, bald eagles, one of the greatest success stories. Um, we just had a handful of nests left back in, in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and now, um, you know, you can see eagles um, all over the state. Um, just, you can just see that, you know, the, the map on the left, which looks like, you know, if you threw black pepper out over a piece of paper, that's how many, you know, sort of nests we have now. And on the bottom right there, you can just see the, the rapid, almost exponential rise in the number of nesting pairs, a great success story. Um, piping plovers, another one, a bird that was um, in Maine down to only about 20 in 1981. Uh, on the left here is the numbers for the entire Atlantic coast population on the right in, in Maine. And you can just see how you know, the, the numbers just greatly expanded. And that's all around Endangered Species Act work that put money into hiring people to put um, exclosures, predator exclosures around the nests, um, put signage up to watch over the birds, um, protect um, areas of beach habitat where they nest and so forth. And, you know, just phenomenal success. We figured out what the problem was. We invested in it as a society and we turned it around. You know, the wild turkey, another great success story, gone from Maine by about 1840. Um, and then over time with reintroduction efforts from other states where there were healthy turkey populations, we now have so many turkeys that people now complain when they come into their yard and dig up their gardens and, and uh, take over their bird feeders. Maine's had all sorts of other kinds of environmental successes. Um, the restoration of the Kennebec and uh, Penobscot rivers um, uh, that has removed um, dams or put in new kinds of bypasses and things like that for fish. And, you know, the Kennebec River um, uh, near where we live has just been an amazing success story with millions and millions of these alewives and other fish migrating up from the ocean to be able to reclaim their historic spawning grounds and build strong populations that um, help birds, all sorts of birds, fish eating birds, as well as help the whole ecosystem of the Gulf of Maine where they migrate back to. Um, we've had great land protection success here in Maine. Um, you know, um, just massive uh, amounts of um, land that has been protected over recent decades. These are sort of a, a graph of showing the amount um, in different kinds of categories. Um, and, you know, that's come about because of a concerted effort by things um, programs like the Land for Maine Futures Bond Act and, and others to, to really um, commit to finding ways to conserve more habitat for birds, other wildlife, and for the people who enjoy these things. And it probably goes without saying, but sometimes I think we people who love to go out and hike in the woods or, you know, like our time uh, in solace with nature and looking at birds, we sometimes forget that we have the right to want to maintain a future like that that allows our our children and grandchildren to have birds and wildlife in special places and we should um, kind of claim that right and and not be afraid to walk into the the halls of power in the capital of whether it's Maine or the or the national capital to to tell people tell our representatives about um, the future that we want to have there are many things that people can do to help birds. Um, these are just five, you know, uh, simple ones that I put up here. But one of the things that is so critical is that um, that we really think not just about what we can do in our own backyard, but what we can do at at larger scales. And so sometimes I like to say. Uh, you know, this, this little thing, do the one in three, by getting people to think about what's one thing I can do this week or, or each month, um, both at my local home scale, whether it's making my home more energy efficient or growing organic vegetables or whatever it is, to something I can do at the local state level, uh, whether that's being involved in a, uh, a, an environmental organization or a land trust, 
um, or with your local town, something in your in, in your town, um, to something at the national and global level. And today, with the internet, um, it's very easy to um, be able to, you know, send a a note to a legislator um, using um, the the websites of many of the um, environmental organizations that provide you take action opportunities with the click of a button. So it's quite easy to do um, something in each one of these categories, but we need more and more people to do more and more of, the, of them all at all these levels um, to really make a difference. A couple of just items that uh, are related to what we talked about today. Um, you know, Barbara mentioned the LD-155 bill on neonicotinoids, um, something we need to support. We need definitely need to get more and more people and our legislators to um, move through the next version of the Land for Maine's Future Bond Act to be able to allow more land to be conserved in Maine. And uh, NRCM, of course, is one of a, a number of organizations working at, at state and national levels to protect um, the environment and birds. And they make it very easy for you to learn about um, the, the various issues um, and to get involved. And so I encourage you to, um, to look for ways to um, learn about the issues and to do things like sign these petitions or do take actions to send um, letters to your legislators. Um, very easy to do um, and something we should all be just regularly doing to support these, these critical needs for, for birds and solve, solve the, the bird conservation and biodiversity crisis. Um, there are many um, organizations working at um, even more local levels. Maine has, I think it's 88 or something like that, land trust. This is a, a list um, of them all across the state. Uh, just amazing um, groups at the local level that um, need the support of the Land for Maine's Future Bond Act, but we, they need um, people to help with their, their efforts as well. So we'll end there and i um, happy to take questions and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Barbara if she has some some final remarks. Well, thanks, Jeff. Um, I just want to I, I want to make sure that there are time for questions, but I just hope that what people take from this book is inspiration to uh, enjoy Maine's birds to appreciate the bird life we have around us and to and as Jeff says to take conservation action both. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeff and Barbara, for that presentation and for this wonderful book. Uh, we certainly hope that everyone tuned in today uh, will go get their copy at their local bookstore. Um, so we have about um, maybe 16, 17 minutes for questions. Uh, again, if you have a question for either Barbara or Jeff, please type that question in the question box on the lower ribbon of your Zoom screen. And I'm going to start with a question from uh, Jim Handy. Uh, the question is, we have seen species of birds this spring here in Maine that are not usually found here. Uh, some have come from southern and western uh, U.S. habitats. To what extent has climate change played a role uh, in these species visiting Maine this spring? I think that's for Jeff. Yeah, well, um, it, it's, it's hard, of course, to pin down one particular event um, to um, a climate change effect, but we we do know that um, certain species we're seeing more often, um, and um, there it's very likely there are intermingled effects from climate change. You know, there's there's some weather changes that we're seeing, uh, obviously, and weather pattern changes that we're seeing here in Maine that will affect what you know how birds arrive in migration and what birds are, might arrive in migration. Um, we just had um, a white-winged dove in our neighborhood show up a week or two ago and stay for a few days. And, um, you know, that's a bird that um, has become increasingly more, it's still very rare, you know, one every one or two years or something, but, but still um, before like 1970 or 80, there was just a hand, you know, just uh, you could count on one hand the number of records. And now they're coming, you know, more regularly. And so that might be a bird that is either increasing related in some way related to climate change in its native range. So there's more to, to send north or maybe it is being affected by flows of storms moving across the continent and things like that. So 
probably an effect hard to pin down on a specific bird. Great, thank you. Um, this next question is from Robert Ladd. The question is, does the increase in populations of birds such as eagles and turkeys add to the, the decline of uh, more endangered ones? Uh, do they compete for the same space or the same resources? Well, that's a great question. Um, I'm not aware of any, um, well, I will say that I have talked with hunters who say that when turkeys take over an area, you lose the ruffed grouse. And I'm not sure exactly what's going on there, but I can believe it. Turkeys are a heck of a lot bigger. And I have noticed that there are many fewer ruffed grouse in the places that I walk than there used to be. Bald eagles have definitely had a major impact on other bird species in Maine, um, especially osprey along the coast, great blue herons, and uh, great cormorants, which had disappeared from the state, but then came back. They had a small breeding colony um, on, the, on a mid-coast island, and bald eagles basically ate all of their chicks, so they don't, they're not nesting there anymore. So yes, bald eagles can, can have an impact, but there aren't more bald eagles now than there were 50 or 60 years ago, I think. So. Great. Anything to add to that, Jeff? Well, I mean, there, you know, yeah, we, we see changes when we see some of these things come back um, and they're complicated. And of course, when we've made, the, the more we've pinned um, more wildlife birds included into smaller areas, into smaller population sizes, then, you know, you, it, it's harder for, for them to be resilient to change, including changes from another bird that may be coming back in numbers or something like that. So it's, it's complicated. And that, when that's, you know, that's kind of the reason why we need to all be monitoring and watching and thinking about ways to, to, to deal with that and sometimes stepping in with actual, some kind of management um, inter, interventions at certain times, yeah. Yeah, there's a couple of questions in the question box about uh, bald eagles preying on loons uh, and impacting the recovery of loons in Maine. Is that, is that a factor in, um, uh, do bald eagles kind of prey on, on loons or loon chicks? I'm, I'm sure it happens sometimes, but I, I know folks have been keeping really good track of um, loon populations in Maine and and they've generally been doing pretty well. And I, I haven't ever heard anybody say that eagles is what's holding them back, but I don't, I'm not sure. So this next question is from uh, Christina Mitchell who asks, uh, we are hearing many more owls hooting around us in the woods, even during the day. Has Maine seen an increase in the number of owls recently? And is it a sign of a healthy environment? Well, good for you. I'm jealous because the great horned owls and barred owls that I used to hear regularly around me haven't been here this winter, spring. Um, so that's good. Definitely owls um, are somewhat sensitive to forest fragmentation. So it, it does seem like it would be a good thing if you've got owls around. Um, I'm not sure, Jeff, do you know what, what, what the data are on the trajectory in owl populations? I don't know. I mean, they're not a bird that's um, monitored by our traditional um, survey methods for obvious reasons, because they tend to call at night. So you have to have a special kind of an owl survey. And Maine Audubon has, uh, has uh, an owl survey. I think it hasn't been going for a, a huge amount of time. So um, I don't know what trend they've been seeing. I do know, um, you know, just from uh, experience with um, like barred owls, seem to be quite um, qu quite well distributed and, and c relatively common around um, around the state. So I feel like they have a pretty robust population and, and great horned owls probably as well. They're both species that are, are, are quite um, successful over broad regions. Um, but, um, but I don't know if we have any spe very specific information about upward and downward trends. Yeah. Well, Jeff, you just mentioned, uh, you know, bird surveys that happens, and this next question kind of flows right from that. Question is from Jamie McNeil. Question is, how important is citizen science to tracking the ranges of bird species in Maine? 
Are there any programs of note that use sightings from regular citizens to build databases? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, but both of us uh, participate in many of these um, community science uh, types of projects, and um, e eBirds, uh, one of those that is we used extensively for the book, for example. Um, anybody can just submit records of any bird anywhere, basically through that. Um, the main breeding bird uh, atlas, or I guess it's the main bird atlas because it's winter and summer, um, that is uses the eBird portal to put in the information, but is being done um, by um, the main uh, Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and, and Maine Audubon and some others um, is, is a really great one to be part of. And, uh, you know, we, again, both of us are regular participants in, in that. Um, and that is, yeah, that's crucial for seeing the changes and tracking um, the trends in, in abundance. Great. And this next, this next question is similar. Um, question is, has eBird altered the veracity of birding records to the point where we can better predict population trends? I don't know about veracity um, uh, because not every eBird record can get checked. Um, but what it does, I mean, we've all heard about big data. The enormous change is the sheer number of records, which allows for um, the application of statistics in a way that, that we just couldn't get before. So it's much, much more reliable than having maybe 10 people say, well, I've seen more such and such this year. When you get thousands of people putting in their records, then you know something's really going on. Great. Um, this next question is from Janet Brisson um, about puffins. The question is, uh, how far do puffins migrate and when do they migrate and where do they go to? Well, yeah, the, um, there's been some recent work, um, right? Um, here in the Gulf of Maine by tra tracking puffins off of places like Eastern Egg Rock and, and, and uh, the Seal, Seal Island and, and others. Um, and um, what they found is the, the puffins kind of drop south um, off of places like, uh, you know, Long Island and, and New Jersey, um, you know, well offshore often, you know, maybe, you know, something 50 or 100 miles offshore, they're staying well out to sea. Um, and, um, and, you know, spending the winter down there, they're, you know, they're kind of flexible and that depending on weather conditions, they can kind of push a little further south or a little bit further north and where the, you know, they're tracking food sources. Um, and then, um, and yeah, and then they come back sort of in probably, I, you know, March um, to, to the coast, March, April. And, and um, I know the birds are, are already out on the, the islands. I've heard reports of the puffins are back on, on a number of the islands off the main coast already. So yeah, and then they start, you know, leaving um, in the fall and um, uh, in, well, the adults are gone usually in, in August, they start disappearing um, and, and sort of filtering out and then um, the young a little bit after that. So probably by, you know, mid October or something, um, you know, November, they're starting to move further and further south and drifting down towards that winter range. I don't know if Barbara, if you have anything to add to that, but. No, I think, I think the important thing is that, that we, that where they go in the winter isn't so visible to most of us because it's mostly offshore, well offshore. So this information comes from either tracking individual birds with, you know, GPS trackers or um, people doing ship surveys. Great. Um, so moving from puffins uh, to Canada geese, uh, <laughs> the question is from uh, uh, Philippa Stratton. Uh, question is, what's the trend here in Maine with the uh, Canadian geese population? And uh, what effect uh, do Canadian geese have on, on other uh, birds here, uh, here in Maine? Well, um, there are a lot more of them than there used to be. And um, I think I have this right, Jeff, that um, Part of what's happened is that is that Canada geese used to pass through Maine on their way much farther north to nest, and some still do that. But we now have populations that stick around year round, and that was that was in part because of the release of some populations that had been 
locally reared who had kind of lost that migration instinct. So it's a little, it's kind of an interesting thing that it's a little hard to tell how, what the global population of Canada geese are doing. It's that we've got these more birds that stick around in Maine than they used to. What impact they're having on other birds, I don't know. I just know that um, they have an impact on golf courses and that sort of thing. Not always very popular species. Yeah, and some, you know, the, the, um, the popular, the sort of the, the wild migratory or, original population um, has, been, has been struggling more, you know, um, the ones that are going way up into the, the you know, the Northern Canada to, to breed. Um, and at least some of those populations have, have been struggling, but it's really hard to differentiate um, which population you're seeing, especially in the winter, you know, the birds from up north are mingling with these sort of uh, uh, semi-feral kind of um, um, non-migratory birds. And it's just a little bit hard to tell them apart. So um, it's really a tough management and monitoring um, question. Um, this next question is about pesticides. You know, Barbara, you mentioned neonicotinoids in your presentation, and there's a couple of questions here about, you know, how serious a threat, you know, pesticides and neonicotinoids uh, are to, to Maine's bird population and, um, you know, the, the seeds that people put out in, in their bird feeders that might have been, um, you know, grown with, with pesticides, how big of a threat are, are they to, to the birds in their, in their backyard? So maybe just if you could speak a little bit more to the threat that pesticides uh, play to Maine's bird populations. Well, I'll give it a try. Um, the trouble is that it's darn hard to know. And the, when I was speaking, of, when I raised the issue of neonicotinoids, it was in relation to insect declines. What's notable is that the reason that Europe was able to ban them was because they had great data. They had, um, people had been collecting not just um, you know, species, this particular um, butterfly or fly has this distribution. But they actually knew how many of them there were because people had been going out and doing surveys that were quantitative. And then they could look at how that had changed over, that, over time. And that contributed to this precipitous decline that prompted um, the, the burgeoning head, headlines about the ap apocalypse. And that went along with um, correlational data about where were these new insecticides being used. On the, on the US side, we just don't have those data of before and after of the number of insects. What we do have are a, a growing number of studies of birds specifically looking at, at what's happened when, for instance, there was a spill of some corn seed that had been treated with neonicotinoids and it, the runoff got, went into a farm pond and the swallows didn't have anything to eat because no insects hatched from that pond or the impact it had on the ability of, I think it was a sparrow species in the West to um, orient and migrate properly and put on weight when it needed to. These kinds of things, we're just beginning to get these studies, but um, the impact on bees is a little better documented, and it's kind of extrapolation to the rest of it. Other pesticides. Well, there, there, there is a bill in the Maine legislature this year uh, to direct the Maine Board of Pesticide Control to prohibit the use of certain neonicotinoids um, for outdoor residential use. Uh, it's a bill sponsored by Representative Nicole Grahowski from Ellsworth. And the bill actually has passed out of the committee and it passed the House and the Senate uh, oh, last wow. week. Um, it, it needs another round of voting um, and they're likely to do that on May 13th when mm -hmm. the House and Senate reconvene uh, at the Augusta Civic Center. So that bill is moving forward. And again, it's already passed the House and Senate, but it needs a second round of voting before it heads to the governor's desk. So that's that's positive development there. So, um, just, so we're running out of time. Oh, go ahead, Barbara. No, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> so we've just got a minute left, um, and there's a couple questions about you know where folks can buy the book, and um, so maybe let's just end on uh, you know places where folks can can buy the book, and uh, and we'll go go ahead and wrap right up. 
well, last I knew it was still available at the Gulf of Maine bookstore in Brunswick, which is my local bookstore. And you can also find it um, uh, through Princeton University Press website, where they have a catalog of all the books that they publish. And that would be a pretty reliable way to get it. And I won't mention the A word. <laughs> Well, that's fantastic. Well, thank you both, uh, Jeff and Barbara, for this presentation today and for all your hard work on this, this wonderful book. We hope that everybody who tuned in enjoyed the program this afternoon and will go out and purchase a copy of the book and share it with their friends and family. Um, again, this webinar was recorded and you'll get an email from me tomorrow with a link uh, to, to uh, watch this recording. And we hope that you'll share that with your friends and family as well. Um, so Allison, do you have anything else to say before we, we sign off here? No, I just want to thank everyone for taking some time this afternoon to join us for this exciting presentation. And thank you, Jeff and Barbara, very much. My pleasure. Nice to be with you. Thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.